Hello, everyone. Um, and one more quick announcement. I know that we are seat limited. I don't think there's ever been this many people in this room. If you are um, without a seat, unfortunately, based on fire code, we can't bring any more seats in here. Um, however, if you don't want to stand for the, for the talk, we will have this recorded tonight and we'll have it on the Whitney website in a couple of days. So um, that's the, the alternative to standing. And I really apologize. We're, we're so great to have you here and we're glad that you're here. We just don't have enough seats. Okay. It is time though, so I'm going to go ahead and begin with the introductions. Happy New Year. Glad you guys are here. It's great to see so many faces, lots of new faces and lots of faces that I recognize. So this is our first uh, installment of the Evenings at Whitney um, lecture series for 2017. I want to draw your attention to next month. We do have a speaker on February 9th. It's going to be pretty interesting as well. But um, I'm really surprised at this turnout. That means everybody wants to know what's going on, right? Um, it's my honor to, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Maitani um, Ola Berriata. And so Maitani is, is um, a new faculty member at the University of Florida uh, in, in ocean engineering and brings a really interesting suite of skills to the table. Um, a mix of oceanography, physical oceanography, engineering, physics, and mathematical modeling, and gizmos. And we're going to see some gizmos tonight, which are really interesting uh, for guys like me. We can't get enough. Um, but she brings all that together. And, you know, I always say when I introduce a speaker that I got to tell you something a little personal about them to make it, uh, make the connection with the audience. And so uh, Maitani, as you can tell by her name, is from Spain. But she doesn't claim to be Spanish. She claims to be Basque. And now if you get that wrong, Maitani is going to tell you, all right? She's going to correct you, as I found out early in our relationship, right? Um, but with coming from the Basque region, you also uh, kind of embody this um, fierce independence. And if you see Maitani out doing her research, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Because here she is on a jet ski with a balloon, a uh, drone, and some other computer gizmos in four foot seas taking measurements out in Matanzas Inlet. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see what she has to talk about tonight and to show us. So let's, let's join, join me in welcoming Maitani. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Whitney Lab for inviting me over to give this uh, talk tonight. And second, I want to thank you all of you for sharing this uh, evening with me. I hope you all take something from, uh, from this uh, talk. So, uh, as Todd was uh, mentioning, I'm a physical oceanographer. I work in coastal environments and specifically in inlets. Inlets are environments, are, as I will explain later, where we have a combined effects of tidal currents and waves. And we need to combine all this physics to understand what is happening in a tidal inlet. And that's what it makes these coastal environments so challenging. They are very dynamic and sand moves very fast. We still don't understand them very, very well. And this is the focus of my research primarily. As you have noticed, I have a pretty strong Spanish accent. My English is not perfect yet. So please, if there is any question, something is not clear, please ask me. I'm good with that. So this is the system where my research is focused on. It's the Guana Tolomato Matanzas estuary. It's a system that is uh, 36 miles long. And primarily, I'm going to focus in this system that is called the Matanzas Inlet area that you all know pretty well, I think. So basically, the, the Matanzas Inlet has a dimension of about 0 0.7 miles. And here, the point that I wanted to make is that this system, all this coastal zone, is located in a transgressive barrier island. This means that the barrier island is trying to move landwards. Hmm? Landwards, landwards towards the land, okay? Yes? So, 
I'm going to basically start my talk by answering the question that I posted in the title. Why are Matanzas Inlet and the adjacent coastlines so dynamic? So the first answer to this is that it is a transgressive barrier island. Okay, so basically what we have is these bars, long bars of sand that because of the effects of the storm is trying to push or that's the theory that it's trying to push the waves and the ocean, it's trying to push that sand landwards and that moves up towards the mainland, the, uh, these barrier islands. The way in which that sand movement happens is by the formation of these kind of like system that they are called overwash fans. They happen during the storms where when the water overtops the dunes, there is sand transport to the back barrier zone. And that is what we are seeing here. This is a diagram. Here is the ocean and here the estuary or the inner part of the, the estuary. And the other mechanism by which this sediment transport towards the back barrier can happen is by opening new bridges. This is a new bridge that was opened here during Hurricane Matthew. It's, this bridge it was located, now it's closed. It was originated or formed south of uh, Matanzas Inlet. The other reason why these systems are so dynamic, I explained it before, is because in tidal inlets, and here you are seeing Matanzas Inlet, this is the bridge, this is the area of the estuary, and this is the open ocean part. You see all these vortexes and all these whitish colors. That is sand in resuspension, and all those vortices basically are representative of how strong the currents are in this area. The currents here can be up to 1.5 meters per second or 2 meters per second. That is a very, very big current system. They are tidal currents primarily, what govern these dynamics. And then on the other hand, from the ocean, we have the ebb tidal delta where the waves are breaking. That breaking produces turbulence, that produces sediment resuspension. So what we have is waves resuspending sediment and tidal currents moving all that sediment. And this is why we see these fast movements of the sandbars that are located in this, in this area. And this is part of my research. My research has been focused on analyzing how the sand moves between the ebb tidal delta, I will explain now what that is, and the flat tidal delta, and the inner part of the estuary. So this is an, a sketch of the, um, the morphological elements that we see in a barrier island system. So we can start from the mainland area, then we have all the marsh area and the tidal creeks, the shoreline, shoreline the tidal flats. Here what we have is the coastal bay or the estuary. Here, the barrier island composed by, again, the shoreline, the dunes, the four dunes, the beach areas. And here, what we have is a connection between this coastal lagoon and the open ocean. Yes? So basically, what we see here is these dashed lines. What they represent are sand deposits. So we have one sand deposit in the estuarine part of this inlet that is called the flat tidal delta, and in the ocean part, we have another big sand deposit. And basically, this is what I analyze. What happens with the sand in this system? Does the sand go in? Does it go out? Or does it go in the southward direction or in the upward direction? And I also analyze how the morphology of this system modifies how the tides propagate into the estuary because this affects, it can affect the water quality, how often is that water inside the estuary replaced. Eh? So it has also water quality and ecolo ecological repercussions. So can we identify these elements that I mentioned in this image? Yes, right? So we have the mainland in here, the marsh areas in here, here, what we have is the intracoastal that it's always flooded. This could be the estuary, the coastal lagoon, basically our tidal inlet. 
these sand deposits is the ebb tidal delta that moves constant, constantly, as you have seen with your eyes, the sand here is moving constantly, right? And then here, in this part, is where we have the uh, flat tidal delta. And we're going to see also like the beach area, the dunes and the four dunes in this image pretty clearly. So which are the physical processes that shape this landscape? So inside the estuary, the tides are the main mechanism by which the landscape is shaped. How the main channels, where the main channels are located, their area, and also the tidal flats and the intertidal areas, those morphological elements are primarily shaped by the tides. Hmm? Then they are colonized by vegetation or oyster reefs, and there are like uh, feedbacks, very complex feedbacks that will also shape the landscape. In the ocean part, the dominant process shaping that landscape and transporting sediment are the wind waves. And then we have the inlet, that is the transition zone between the estuary and the open ocean. And in this place, both processes combine. So I'm going to give an overview of which are the main current systems that transport sediment both in the near shore, in the source zone where the waves are breaking, and also inside the estuary, what are the tidal currents, how do they look like in this area, and then I will describe what happens in tidal inlets, very briefly. So in the near shore, I'm in the ocean part, here is the beach, and this is the source zone where the waves are breaking. So the first time of type of current that we can have in these kind of systems are the rip currents. Hmm? The rip currents, as you know, they pose an hazard for swimmer because rip currents are directed towards the open ocean. So basically, if you are trapped in a rip current, they will take you to the open ocean. But the other thing of the rip currents, as you can see in this image, is that they also transport sediment towards the offshore. The second type of currents are the longshore currents. Hmm? So to have these currents form, we need wind waves to have an oblique incidence with respect to the coastline. So in this case, the waves are coming in this direction and they form an alongshore current that basically in this surf zone we are going to have a lot of like sediment into suspension and these longshore currents are going to transport the sediment in this direction. So in this coastal area, there is a mean alongshore current. So in this figure, you can see this is south of Matanzas Inlet. Waves are propagating in this particular day in this direction. And this is creating an alongshore current that is blowing southwards. In this area, the mean Littoral drift, that is how much sediment is transported, is southwards, and this is the estimate of this littoral drift, is 400,000 cubic yards per year. Okay, so the last type of uh, currents that we can have in the near shore, so in the open ocean, in the beach, are the undertows, and these are especially important in storms. So what happens in the storms? Here what we are seeing is a transect or a profile of the beach. Here what we have is a dune area, here the open ocean. So this is the profile of the beach, and here what we have is waves propagating towards the beach. If these waves are big, we can have a return current that is called undertow. And this return current, what it does is it erodes the upper part of the beach profile and it transports sediments downward. So basically, in storms, these times of currents are very important because these are the ones that are going to create all this erosion in the upper part of the, of the beach. So consequently, what we are going to happen because of these currents, we are going to see that our dune areas, the upper beach profile, is going to be eroded, and there's going to be sedimentation in the lower part of the beach profile. 
Okay, what can happen in barrier lilands? So here everything gets a little bit more complicated because in the landward part of the dunes we have an estuary, so we have water, right? So when we are in a storm, this water level, we are going to have a surge that is pretty high and on top of that, we are going to have pretty big waves propagating towards the beach. So what's going to happen is that sometimes this water is going to overtop the dunes. If that overtopping is not very frequent and it happens sometimes, what's going to happen is that this water that goes towards the estuary is going to transport this sediment to this part over here. <clears throat> and consequently, what we are going to see is an accumulation of sand in this part. So this is what it creates, the overwash fans, are basically all this sand that is transported from the beach towards the dune areas. Okay? Now, if things get a little bit worse and that overtopping occurs very frequently, or this flooding is very, very extreme, what's going to happen is that we are going to have erosion of the dune and there's going to create a permanent connect, permanent, sorry, permanent, I will say it, permanent connection between the ocean part and the estuary, yes? And in this case, what do we create? We create a bridge, yes? It's a permanent opening, like in this case. So what it has happened here is that in this area, the water level overtopped the dunes, that part was eroded, and that hole was eroded, probably there was the position in here, but this is going to be a permanent connection between the ocean and the inner part of the estuary. And this can evolve. They can evolve in such a way that they close naturally, or they can evolve into an inlet and develop this structure of the ebb tidal delta and the flat tidal delta that is characteristic of the tidal inlets. Now, inside the estuary, Tidal currents, as I said, are the most important um, processes shaping the landscape. Winds also have relevance and freshwater fluxes also, but the most important things are the tides. So the tides are ocean waves as well. They are much, much longer. The period in this place is 12.42 hours. We have a semi-diurnal tide. That means that we have two high tides and two low tides in a day. Yes, and basically they are produced by the gravitational forces between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun. And sometimes those gravitational forces, they can combine together, and that's what happens during the full moon and during the new moon. And that's when we get the spring tides. The tides are bigger than usual. On the contrary, sometimes those gravitational forces, they counteract each other, and what we are going to have is the nip tides, okay? The tides are going to be a smaller in amplitude than in general. <clears throat> Here what we are seeing is a map of the South Atlantic Bay. Here what we have is Cape Atheras and here Cape Canaveral. And this map is showing which is the amplitude of the main astronomy component, the M2 component, along the South Atlantic Bay. What we see is that there is a gradient on the tidal range, basically, between the apex of the South Atlantic Bay and it decreases the amplitude as we move southward. We can also see that the tides propagate in this direction. Now, what happens with the tides? How are the tides generated between the open ocean and the estuary? So what's going to happen is that there's going to be a water level difference between the open ocean and the estuary. So when the waves, the tidal wave is propagating in the ocean, we might have in the ocean high tide and inside the estuary maybe it's not high tide yet. So that water difference, what produces is these flat currents, right? Now, in this system, it is pretty peculiar because along this estuary, we have two main connections with the ocean. One is located in San Agustin, the other one is located in Matanzas Inlet. So what happens during the flood is that the currents flow towards the inner part of the estuary in San Agustin, and then they go southwards. 
They flow from the ocean to the inner part of the estuary in Matanzas Inlet, and part of it goes northwards, and then part of it goes southwards towards Pellicer Creek. So what happens in here is that we think there is a zone where the current tidal velocities are minimum, and we are analyzing this, what happens with this current system, because it's pretty peculiar. During the ebb tide, what it happens is that everything reverses. So now what we are going to have is that this water that went into the estuary filled the estuary, and in the ocean part, the tidal, the water level is still a little bit lower. So the water reverses. So what we are going to see is the, is the water going out through Matanzas Inlet and San Agustin. We are going to see northward currents flowing from the devil's elbow northwards and southwards going towards Matanzas Inlet. And this system where this zero velocity zone is located, we think it changes in time and it might change depending on if we, they are like nip tides or they are spring tides. Okay, these are some measurements taken. So here what we are seeing in this axis is time. So what we have is four days, right? And here what we have is the water surface elevation taken or measured at these different stations. So basically what we use to measure that is this sensor, yes? So we put it in the PVC tube and we deploy it somewhere, in this case in all these points. And what we can measure is where is the water elevation. And with that, what we can analyze is how the tide propagates in the estuary. So basically here what we can see is that there is a phase lag of the tide between the inlet and, for example, the area of the Pellicer Creek. It takes like more than two hours, there is a two-hour difference, more than two-hour difference in the high tide between Matanzas Inlet and Pellicer Creek. And what we can also see is that the tidal range in both the stations is pretty different. So as the tide propagates through the estuary, it dissipates, it's dumped. Hmm? And that is going to affect how the currents are and how strong they are. This, it's representing kind of a similar time series, but now instead of measuring the free surface elevation, we use another instrument, those gadgets that Todd was talking about. We use this instrument, and what this instrument does is it measures the currents basically at different points in the water column. And then we can average that and get these kind of plots showing which is the vertically average current velocity. So basically here what we are seeing is this tidal oscillation of the velocities. The maximum velocities here are about 0.5 meters per second. Okay, now going to the inlets. In inlets we have the mixture of both kind of processes. We have tidal currents acting in, that I represented here with this uh, blue arrows, and then we are going to also have the effects of the waves. What the waves try to do is they try to close the inlet, and what the tides do, the tidal currents, they try to open that inlet. In the case of Matanzas Inlet, there was a study by Taylor Engineering in which they computed that Matanzas Inlet was importing sediment, and that this was the amount of sediment that was yearly taken from the ocean towards the inner part of the estuary. So basically the estuary, the inlet, it's importing sediment to the inner part of the estuary. So basically, schematically, which is the role of the wind waves in tidal inlets? So here we have a simplified schematic representation of what an inlet is. Here we have the barrier island, and this is representing the littoral drift or those alongshore currents. So, sorry for that. So what the waves are, are going to try to do is they are going to try to put sediment at the end of this inlet. And what the tides are going to do is they are going to try to keep open this inlet. But as you can see in this image, eh, there is a very 
non-linear and complex interactions between those littoral currents and the tidal currents. So, for example, in this image, what we can see is, again, Madanza's Inlet, this is taken from Google Earth, what we see is you see all this, like, brown area within the surf zone, that is the littoral drift. So in this day, we have waves coming from this direction, and they are transporting all this sediment. And here, what we are seeing is these ebb currents, how they are interacting with those or that littoral drift. So the process is very complex, and this is what I am analyzing in my research. What happens with that sediment? Does it go southward? Does it go to the inner part of the estuary, or does it go offshore? And in which conditions, in which tide and wave conditions do those sediment transport processes happen? Okay, another effect of the <clears throat> differential effect of the waves and the, the tides is that the tides, the waves, sorry, are going to try to increase the volume of the flat delta, the sandbar that was inside the inlet. Eh? Whereas the tides are going to do the opposite, and they are going to, they try to increase the volume of the ebb tidal delta. So basically here, the message is, if we make any changes, not us, the nature, if it changes the wave conditions or the wave climate, how often storms happen, this the form of those sandbars and also the area of the inlet, it's going to change. That is the, the main idea. And then, in the other hand, is if we also modify not only the waves, if we modify the currents of the estuary by, let's say, filling a part of an estuary that's going to change the current system, this inlet is going to change its form to respond to those human interventions that we have done in the estuary. <clears throat> now, I was going to show you this, but unfortunately, I can't. It was a movie showing over the years how was the main change that we could see in the estuary. Yes, so I used a, a tool that is called Google Earth Engine. It puts together a lot of like satellite images, and from those images, we can see when and how all that sun moved. We analyzed those images, and <clears throat> basically, those sun movements, I'm going to skip this one. Here we go. So here what we can see is the period that we found, the period that was one of the periods most affected or that showed the biggest changes in the inlet, okay? So that period is between 2007 and 2009. So here what we are seeing is an aerial image, satellite image of Matanza Sinle 2007. Here what we see is the same, but in 2009. So look at this. You see, there is much more sand in the inlet trough. So basically, the inlet was trying to close. Hmm? And what happened between 2007 and 2009? Well, what happened is that the Summer Heaven Ribbon got filled during that period. So basically, what happened is that once this Summer Heaven River got closed. Part of the tidal flow that went to Matanzas Inlet directly got reduced. And basically, that reduction is what we think. It produced the closing or the partial closing of the inlet. So, why, this, why did Summer Heaven River close? So one of the reasons why it closed was because of a storm. It was tropical storm Faye that happened in 2008. There was a tropical storm, and that tropical storm opened a bridge just between Summer Heaven River and the open ocean. And after that tropical storm, there were a sequence of storms, different nor'easter storms, that basically pushed sand into the Summer Heaven River and closed it. So basically, that uh, closed the connection. So this is what we are seeing here, right? You see how 2007, we can see that there is 
an open channel, right? That goes directly to the inlet. Here, what we see is this big sand deposit that was brought into the estuary because of the waves, basically. Now, there was another event, and you know all of you very, very well, that really impacted this area, was uh, Hurricane Matthew that impacted this area in October the 7th. <clears throat> so basically, we are analyzing this storm, this hurricane, and we are modeling the wind fields, the wave fields, the storm surge, everything that we can model with a computer model. So this is the scheme of that computer model. It's a big computer model that is able also to transport sediment and change the morphology. And I'm going to show you some. I'm going to skip those. So this is, for example, let's see. I have some movies here. Uh, but no, they can't open. Okay. I am going to probably skip the movies if somebody wants to see the movies. So basically what we do, and now it doesn't work anything. Let's see. Let's wait a little bit. Ah, here we go. So basically what we do is we use these numerical models so here, for example, we can see at the beginning when the hurricane was hitting parts of uh, South Florida. Hmm? This is the wind system that's showing with the arrows, and the colors are showing which was the wave height. Hmm? I have a movie showing how this system evolved in time. So basically what we do is we use these computer models to simulate everything, and then we take data to see if our simulations are correct or not. Sometimes are not correct, and we need to know why they are not correct. Sometimes the physics that we simulate are not correct. We need to know how well we are doing it. And the problem with hurricanes is that our buoys that measure wave heights or the surges, sometimes they get broken because there is so much energy in the ocean that sometimes they stop uh, measuring. Here, what we have is the only measurement that I had close to uh, Cape Canaveral. It's located in this buoy, and this is measuring which is the wave height. So here, what we have is a time series, how the wave height change in time in this location. These are the measurements, and when the hurricane hit that area, the buoy got broken, so we don't have more measurements. But in general, the trend of the model and the measurements is pretty good. And we did the same for the storm surge. We can kind of like trust the model pretty well. And then the idea is now we have the model for the open ocean to downscale this to this estuary and particularly to Matanzas Inlet to see how the waves here, how were the storm surge here, how was the storm surge here, and how were the current system in this area. But we are still working on that. So basically, these are the wave conditions. Here we have the wave conditions that hit pretty badly all this area. We had offshore waves that were predicted with a model of 12 meters. That is pretty, that is offshore. It's not in the coast, eh? but still very, very energetic. And here what we can see is what is the tide plus the um, the tide plus the surge levels. So here what we have is maximum levels of about three meters, that for this area it's pretty big too. With all this information we can make a map like that showing which are the areas that uh, were hit like more badly by the storm and we can compare these numerical results with real measurements, yes? So we can learn what do we do well and what do we don't do well so we can improve our science. Now, these are some measurements taken in your dock. Yes. <laughs> so these are measurements taken during Matanza, uh, Hurricane Matthew. And it's showing the comparison between the free surface elevation, so the water levels time series, 
taken in the mouth of Matanzas Inlet and in Pelissar Creek. Matanzas Inlet is shown in blue, so here what we see are the tidal oscillations, and suddenly what we see is that the sea water level increases, increased a lot. That was basically the effect of the surge that was brought by the Hurricane Matthew. And the total water level was more around seven feet, what we measure in that particular dock. And it was a little bit lower eh, in the area of uh, Pelissar Creek. This other graph, what it's showing is, which was the temporal evolution of higher, lower, higher period waves. So the wind waves and other kind of oscillations. And there were in this area that is usually sheltered by this heptidal delta, yes, and the waves are not that big there. There were waves that were like half a meter, like this side. That is pretty big. So the storm, as you all know, was very, very energetic. These are some pictures, you know, it was amazing. I was really amazed by this. This was in the area where this new bridge opened south of Matanzas Inlet. This is not the ocean part. This is the back barrier. And what you see here are parts of this highway. It was like the harbor that was basically completely broken and everything transported to the back barrier. Okay, so this is showing which was an aerial image in February 2016. And what we did was after the hurricane, we used this instrument over here. It's a drone and we flew the drone. And basically, with all the images taken with the drone, we can put them together and we can create an image similar to that, but for the situation after the storm. So what we can see by comparing these two images is that there was sedimentation in the flat tidal delta. And here you cannot see it very well, but basically what we saw is that the ebb tidal delta was completely eroded. There was no more sand in here, or there was very, very little. So here you can see how we have this beautiful and big sand deposit. All this was eroded, and we think that that sand went part to this area, and part of it went up into the estuary. Now, we will continue doing these measurements. We also measured the bathymetry under the water, and we will track that for my project is for four years, so we think on doing that like for four years, more or less, and see how the system is changing and what is happening with that sand. So basically what we have is an area after Matthew of accretion and an area of erosion. Here we have another picture showing which was like the ocean part of the inlet before Hurricane Matthew, we can see here that there is this nice bar, and after Hurricane Matthew, all this sand was gone. And you can also see these rocks over here, how they are much more exposed after the hurricane. This means that all this sand that was located in here was taken somewhere. It's not there anymore. Finally, I'm going to finish with the other like big impact that Hurricane Matthew did. So basically, we are, I'm going to focus in this area south of Matanzas Inlet. And what happened here is that after Hurricane Matthew, this bridge was created. So again, we went with our drones, fly the drones, and capture how this bridge was and how it evolved over time. So basically, that bridge started to close. This is the, the back barrier zone. So basically, it created a closure and a kind of like a pond in here, yes? And then what it created was this, so this is the closure, basically. And what we have in here, it was like kind of like a pond. And then we can see how over the time this bridge became an inlet with the typical structure of the ebb tidal delta and here the flat tidal delta. Sediment transport here was incredible. I went there like many, many times, and that system was incredibly dynamic, and it evolved. So now what we are going to do is use these computer models. We have a data set that 
it's not very usual to have not many people have this data set to analyze how these systems evolve. And it is important to know how these systems evolve, because if it happens again, what do we do? Do we close it or do we let the system, and it might close naturally, we don't know it yet. So it is important that we have this data set, that we see how good our computer models are, and then we can use our computer models to decide what we want to do or what we should do. So basically, this inlet evolved, and at the end, November 30th, it was closed by human interventions. Okay, so that bridge inlet does not exist anymore. But we have the data set. That is a very good thing, I think. So, next, what is coming next? The next thing that is going to happen in this area, as you all know, is that they are planning to open this Summer Heaven River. So, what our hypothesis is, is that when they open Summer Heaven River, the flow in Matanzas Inlet is going to increase, and that's going to open the inlet, it's going to increase the area of the inlet, so we are going to be measuring with all these instruments again the flows, the sediment transport. We will be flying the drones and see if our hypothesis is true or if we are wrong. <clears throat> However, this part in here, once it is open, it's very narrow. The dunes are pretty low, and I think in this project what they are going to do is increase take that sand and put it like in the dune area so it increases the height of the dunes, but still it's a very narrow back barrier island. It's very narrow there, so when there are storms, it's going to be, in my opinion, like a very fragile or vulnerable area because when you have overtopping, if you have a lot of land after it, it's going to be very difficult to open a bridge. But if there is no land, if there is water, then it's much more easier for nature to open a new bridge. Hmm? So there is going to have, it's going to be probability. If we have lots of storms, it might open again, and then we don't know what's going to happen with it. Summary of all this talk, it was pretty long. Basically, we are in a barrier island, that is transgressive, so basically it's trying to put all this sand that is in the coastal zone backwards, or that's basically the theory. So we are going to see that, and we will see that happening more and more with the, with the storms. <coughs> what we see with the storms is that these storms, they produce overwash fans and new breaches. That might be like one of the mechanisms by which this transgression happens in nature. Uh, we saw that Matanzas Inlet imported sediment towards the inner part of the estuary during Hurricane Matthew. And well, what we expect with the Summer Heaven River opening is that it will flash more the inlet and will increase basically the inlet area and the volume of the tidal delta. All my acknowledges to the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Geological Survey, to Whitney Lab, to the UTMNER, lots of uh, people over here, to all the people that have allowed us to put our instruments in their houses. Thank you very much. That is very important. <laughs> yes, and of course, like to the lab technicians that are working with us, and um, yeah. To all the people that has come to, to the beach, when I was working there with the drone, lots of people would come asking, like, what are you doing? And everybody was interested, and yeah, they encourage us to continue with the research. So thank you to, the, to them, too. And that's it. I'm going to finish, if we can, watching a video that we took from this area. Uh, let's see if we can find it here. Let's see. So this video was taken before Hurricane Matthew, yes? So here what you are seeing is the flat tidal delta, the inner part of the estuary. They are like beautiful bed forms and sand forms in this area. 
This is the bar that was located towards the ocean part, close to the bridge that it's gone now. It does not exist anymore, and all this sand, or part of it, has also disappeared. And this rope over here is because at that time we were not flying the drones, we were flying some balloons. So if you saw somebody with a big blue balloon in the beach, that was us <laughs> taking some measurements. Yeah. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be glad to, to answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay.